happy to, to have you here. I think it's a very happy, online. serendipitous event that this won't be able to air on the 4th of July. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be nice? I think he would have been pleased. He huh? surely would have. Yeah, and thank right. you for having me, Earl. My pleasure. The book is fantastic. You've really done a beautiful job. We'd love to let everybody know it. And I'm really looking forward to this. And welcome. Welcome very much to our conversations. Pleasure to welcome the program. Eric, er, Eric S. Peterson. And he's a, he's a lawyer, and he's a managing partner in the firm uh, Hawkins, Delafield, and Wood, LLP. And perhaps we want to talk a little of those matters. And then also, uh, he's the creator and the editor of an extremely interesting book about as highly recommended as possible, possible to do called Light and Liberty, and it's subtitled uh, Reflections on the Pursuit of Happiness, a compilation of the writings of uh, Thomas Jefferson, and I can't think of a better guest to air here on July. This will air on July 4th, 2005. Welcome very much to Manhattan Network Conversation. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my pleasure to welcome you. The book is fantastic. We want to get to that, obviously, and so forth. But I wonder if maybe you could, we, as we like to do, if you could share a little of your own background and the work that you're doing in the legal realm and so forth is extremely relevant and in keeping, I think, with some of the Jeffersonian notions, too. But could you share some of your background, born and raised? education a little bit. Sure. Mm. Born in Boston, raised mm. in uh, Pennsylvania, north of Philadelphia, mm -hmm. public high school, Pinsbury High School in uh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Oh, it's Went a beautiful to, country. Yeah. It's beautiful down there. It's yeah. where George Washington crossed the Delaware. Is that where it was? Yeah. Yeah, right, it was uh, there? Yes, uh, six months after George Wash after uh, Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. And Is it was that where he attacked Congress. the Hessians? Yeah, that's where he attacked the Hessians. That was a major turn. It turned the tide of the war. So it really I grew up truly did, five yeah. miles from Washington's Crossing, Pennsylvania. It had been really touch and go, hadn't it? It really had been. Uh -huh. And uh, I uh, went to Brown University, studied uh -huh. American history. Rhode in, Island? In Rhode Island, yeah. the province of Rhode Island. Studied history? Yes, American uh -huh. history and political science. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I went to the University of Chicago Law School. Okay. I've been a practicing attorney here mm -hmm. in New York with uh, the law firm Hawkins, Delafield, and Wood. From the get-go. From the get-go since uh -huh. 1973. Uh -huh. Our firm is uh, a specialized firm. We specialize in representing municipal governments, state and local governments, and you public finance and public contract matters. I see. Represent municipal governments. Okay. And that would encompass the cities, towns, cities, villages? Cities, towns. Or? Counties, Not states, federal. state, state governments, state uh, government occasionally the federal government. It's mostly state and local government projects, public works, public programs of various kinds, municipal bond issues, uh -huh. public works contracts for large public uh, facilities like water plants, wastewater plants, roads, roads, infrastructure, roads, infrastructure healthcare, anything of a public uh, project nature it, that uh -huh. you issue tax exempt bonds for, our firm works on it. Uh -huh, that's interesting. The bonds, as far as that, as far as it would be compared with equities, bonds are a little bit more secure in a certain sense. Am I correct? The interest rates are a little lower, it's a little more secure long term. It's a different investment strategy in the it's bond a world. It's fixed, in uh, the fixed interest payments uh -huh. uh, generally, uh, very strong, highly rated credits, many of them backed by the power of taxation, others by fees and pledges of revenue streams and so forth. Mm -hmm. I've, I've enjoyed working in this field. It takes mm -hmm. me around the country, and you get to really appreciate the um, structure of government that yeah. Thomas Jefferson wished to see uh -huh. exist you know, in our country. I often say that <laughs> America is fortunate because we had Thomas Jefferson, mm -hmm. and the rest of the world, or most of the rest of the world, had Napoleon or Napoleon's equal. Uh -huh. What I mean by that is that here we're organized from the, from the bottom up, from the individual up. Uh, Thomas Jefferson believed that the best way to have good government would be to take power mm -hmm. and fracture it into as many shards as you possibly could. Mm -hmm. um, you, you have federal power, state power, exercise as many powers as you can at the local level. All power to the wards, he said, place under everyone's eye and hand what he may personally superintend. Like the idea of the town meeting. Town meetings, uh, uh -huh. the tradition of county, local ward government, really, uh, Jefferson was a great champion of that. Uh -huh. uh, in contrast to the model that, that he uh, and had the fellow patriots that founded our country mm -hmm. were fighting against, the, the, the ruler down model, mm -hmm. the despotic model where the king is everything, the central government does everything. And as I look at the kind of work that our law firm does here yeah. in this country and compare it to similar work that goes on in other countries, let's take Mexico, mm -hmm. there is no municipal bond market in Mexico. Okay. Local governments do not have the power to sign contracts without the approval and direction of the central government, the Napoleon, if you will, the central ruling government mm -hmm. in Mexico City, even to this day. Mm -hmm. 
So we're very fortunate that we had the model of local government, the individual up, not the ruler down, take root so strong in this country. Uh -huh. Jefferson uh, said one time that uh, I do not agree that 14 out of 15 people are rogues, but I do believe that rogues would be uppermost. In other words, he thought the average citizen was, was a fairly honest, disinterested person, if you will, but self-interested people, the rogues, would tend to seek the highest offices and the most centralized power. So that's why he was interested in taking governmental power, if you will, and fracturing it into as many pieces as possible mm -hmm. to prevent roguish individuals from getting in a position where they could really do some serious damage if they held all the power in the society. Yeah, they had to come out of a, a European dynastic state place where you had the, even the divine right of kings was being they did. declared, and that had helped for 700 years. It had as an organizing principle for society, and people had their identity wrapped up in those systems, which were seriously challenged by a major revolutionary development that developed here in the country, but reflected an inevitable changing in the zeitgeist or something, do you think? Right, that, that's, that's a good way of saying it, because you know, in this country, uh, all the great founders of the country, Madison, Hamilton, Washington, Franklin, all the greats, mm -hmm. were well aware of their history. They, mm -hmm. they knew uh, the fledgling uh, republics of self-government in Greece and, and, and Rome and so forth, and the dark ages that followed. And they were convinced that they had a once in a millennium opportunity to do something different in this country uh, to establish self-government, republican representative government, protecting the rights of man on a very large scale so it couldn't really be threatened. Uh, you may know that Jefferson served uh, our country as uh, ambassador to France, minister to France. Yes, I did, yeah. In the five years leading up to the French Revolution in 1789. Mm -hmm. And this was after he had written the uh, Declaration of Independence in 1776. Yeah, at the age of 33. Yes, uh, and even uh, as the yeah. U.S. Constitution w was being written. 87, 89. Yeah, 80, mm -hmm. 1787. Yeah, 87, um, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and when he was over there, he took a four-month tour of the countryside of southern France to see how the average citizen lived. And a year later, he went up to Germany. I think. And he went to Germany, yeah. right. And he was able to, he wanted to identify with the way of life of the common man. Mm -hmm. And what he found actually appalled him. Mm -hmm. You know, he said of the 19 millions of people supposed to be in France, mm -hmm. uh, no, almost all of them are live in more wretched conditions than mm -hmm. the most conspicuously wretched individual in the United States. Mm -hmm. He said, how can this be? We have a fertile soil, a genial climate, wonderful culture. All true. And he said they're, they're, they're affected, they're ground to powder, ground to dust by one single vice. And that was a bad form of government. Right. A government from the top down, not self-government, not a government that recognizes, appreciate the freedoms that we have and we enjoy in this country. I wonder if we cast back through history. Hasn't it always been, I think, in Imperial Rome? We had an Imperial Rome. Uh, we had, uh, even even Aristotle said in Periclean Greece, there were a few who led the life of the mind and the spirit and the civilized thing, but mostly it was based upon slaves. Egypt, they had slaves. Nebuchadnezzar had slaves. It's been a slave system. Uh, in the feudal estates, the serfs were wallowing around in the mud. It's always been a few people throughout most of history that has control, a power elite, C. Wright Mills might call them out of sociology, always a power elite that controls and runs things, and most of the people are uh, like uh, serfs or of no account in most systems of political organization throughout all of history. James Joyce said, that, let's say history is a nightmare from which I'm attempting to awaken. And have there been revolutionary, truly revolutionary changes in that historical model away from a, genu a genuinely autocratic power elite that would run everything in all these societies throughout all of history? And was the American Revolution a major revolution in terms of the, the whole sweep of human it wa history? It was. I think it so was too, yeah. the key event. They, mm -hmm. were, they were well aware of their place in history and their opportunities. Jefferson called the kinds of governments that you were just describing governments of kings, priests, and nobles. That was wow. his trilogy of the various power elites mm -hmm. that were uh, in the game largely to preserve and enhance their own power position in society. And he said that uh, the kingly sector, the priestly sector, and the noble sector of the economy tended to sort of aid and abet each other in the preservation and promotion of their own power. That's why he was so against the combination of church and state, for example. 
He wrote that Jefferson Bible. He um, wrote the Jefferson Bible. That was his own. Put it together, that was yeah. his personal attempt to sort of distill uh, the essential meaning of the, of the teachings of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ in in the Christ's own words. Yeah. Now Jefferson stood for uh, <coughs> a complete separation of civil government and organized religion. He thought that the combination of civil government and organized religion, regardless of which government, which religion, had resulted in some of the worst excesses. It fought one of called the 30 Years War. Absolutely. Yeah. The Crusades could be seen as an example. Crusades, of that. another. It doesn't matter what religion you're talking about, yeah. uh, religion, organized religion, tends to want to ally itself with civil government in the promotion of the interests of both. And they also have a sense, if I may, I don't want to get into political ground or anything like that, but they also have a, for want of a better term, a sense of the ontology of everything right on to the end of the universe, ultimate principles that apply. And uh, I mean, give him a chance and everything. We had a new pope and he said, on the first day he was announced, he said the, war, the problem with the world is relativism. There's no need for relativism because we've got the truth. And well, you understand that yes, some yes. people in the hills of Afghanistan think they do, and other things. But that can also be translated politically in an economic theory and so forth. Well, people who have absolute fundamentalist sense of the truth, and I think those feudal lords and the kings really felt that they had a system for the ages, don't you think? They, they felt that way, and it, uh, Jefferson saw that as a recurring tendency throughout history. Continues? Uh, in, in various forms. And, to the and modern day, yes, and you and I this, speak, this yeah. is the reason I chose mm -hmm. Light and Liberty yes. as the title of the book. Yeah, great title. Because it comes from his writings. It comes from his writings. Mm -hmm. he, he felt that light and liberty go together. Mm -hmm. No light, no liberty. Now, that was an interesting Light is new a metaphor for, for, for learning, for education, and education yeah. for, for even more fundamentally for a sense of oneness with other people, with our fellow man around the world, an identification with our fellow man, uh -huh. uh, a sense of what unites us and what we have in common, mm -hmm. rather than our differences and what we what we have, uh, they're you know they're they're, con they're contrasting. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Jefferson's was a great proponent, as we all know, of, yeah. of liberty. Mm -hmm. um, I have sworn on Indivi the altar yeah, individual on. freedom, individual liberty. Right. I have sworn on the altar of God. You will call in Jefferson Memorial mm -hmm. eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. Mm. And so man he, to man could write. He could he really was write. Really eloquent, yeah. But he felt light. Yeah. Light, education, mm. learning, mm -hmm. uh, responsibility for yourself, personal growth, identification with the interests of your fellow man. Right. A spirit of reason, of tolerance, yeah, respect. And it was, it, and it was that kind of thing was necessary to go mm. along with liberty. He said Enlighten the people generally, uh -huh. and tyranny and oppression of body and mind will vanish like evil spirits at the dawn of day. And it was so growing. light was equally important in his scheme of things. Yeah, and it was growing out of the Enlightenment era. And uh, I mean, I, I just said to you, this fellow Edward Herman, he 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 chalks it up like the modern world for whatever it is. We we have a we've had a modernist world, I guess, in a certain sense. We can extend our consciousness through technology, and technology is changing. And the Industrial Revolution was heralded in 1776 by the steam engine. It was blowing in the wind. They could see what was coming or something like that. They have that, that, kind, of, uh, that kind of a thing with the, the Enlightenment. Uh, and so the, 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 the situation was changing, and they wanted to have a system not only for the pr that moment, but it was growing, and, but also with a sense of the, the, the onward movement of things societally and politically and economically. The, the growth and the onward movement, the progress yeah. of society, the betterment of mankind, these were the objectives that Jefferson really devoted his life to. He led a life of service. And we associate Jefferson with the Declaration of Independence, yes, by where, all he, means. where he sets forth his vision. You know, it's essentially the vision that you know, we love about our country, what people admire about America around the world. It's a vision of freedom vision of the rights of man. Rights of man, self, natural law, John Locke. Yes, self-government, uh -huh. equality, and the pursuit of happiness. Those uh -huh. five things are at the heart of Jefferson's vision. No. And when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, that, that was, he called the Declaration of Independence, which we're celebrating on the 4th of July. 229th anniversary, 229th anniversary of that anniversary major death, of July. a major event, and uh, congratulations, America, and here's July 4th, you'll be viewing this. Right. We, go we, on we made it, we've got a long way to go, I'm sure Jefferson would say, but that document really established 
the vision that we all cherish. Uh, and so here you have Thomas Jefferson's vision, uh, and it was accompanied by a dramatic military and political struggle to achieve independence. And that was what the focus of the American Revolutionary War was. Mm -hmm. But when Jefferson came back from his time in France, France. Uh, he saw that vision uh, of equality, the other half, the true promise mm -hmm. of the American Revolution, starting to come under attack. And particularly from people like Hamilton, mm -hmm. who he always felt had a view that the elite knew better than everyone else, hey, who cast good. his lot a little bit more on the king's priest and noble side of things right. than the side of the common man. Uh -huh. And so he had a, a, a decade-long battle mm -hmm. throughout the 1790s to try to consolidate what he regarded as the full promise of the American Re Revolution. Uh -huh. And that promise was the promise of egalitarianism, uh -huh. getting away from aristocracy and elitism, well, and establishing the view that of the of the importance of, of the common man, the average citizen, yeah, and, and their equal rights and opportunities. Yeah, that's right. And that the age made this. And but then some people will say, yeah, but he was doing in a certain sense. Time moves on. We've gone 229 years from that. If we go ahead 229 years into the future, it's hard to imagine where we'll be. Time keeps moving. Things change. The technology changes. The situation changes. But that was written for and by, uh, some people would, in a certain sense, say, uh, for rich white men. That they put it together, they controlled it. There was a Charles Baird's interpretation of the Constitution, economic interpretation of the Constitution, is that it was a power elite that was growing out of that thing. They had a local thing. They were going to do it. And they did continents and had chattel slavery. People were owned. Uh, women were not even considered possible to be able to vote. I mean, there was a lot of progress ahead that sort of, in a certain sense, um, had to be addressed in a historical context, but it wasn't really a thing that was really massively or democratically based in anything like maybe what was to emerge in the time ahead from when they did that. And they were, in a certain sense, establishing their own vested interests as people that were in that leadership position in terms of the society. I mean, how do you address that question? Well, I, I would say that that kind of view... slave laws and this kind of thing. Yeah, I would say that that kind of view is kind of a, a crabbed and ungrateful view of the sacrifices that our founders made, including Jefferson, but all, all the greats, made for the establishment of these principles of, of, of the vision of the future that, that I just described. I mean, uh -huh. after all, think of it this way. Yeah. I mean, we are where we are now. Mm -hmm. and we're going to go somewhere, and, and Jefferson and his, his contemporaries were where they were. And isn't, it, right. isn't it true mm -hmm. that vision takes time to manifest? What, well, what, that could what, be. It's going to take 100,000 years before we get real justice for everybody. We, I mean, it, we've got it, a long we way to, to go. We have to have, wouldn't you agree, that we have to have a set of ideals to aspire toward? I think so. Or we, can't, yeah. we can't, we have to have a vision. We, or yeah. we can, it, it was a vision of equality and the pursuit of happiness and the rights of man, which weren't fully established then, and right. self-government, participatory citizens taking responsibility for their own government, self-government. It had never been tried before on uh -huh. a continent. So just think of what that, what that vision of freedom and all the, all the other elements of vision really meant. Uh -huh. It was something that was unprecedented yeah. uh, on, the, and on the scale on which they were trying it. Uh -huh. And so you have to start somewhere. That was the seminal moment and all the liberties and the prosperity and the progress that we have had ever since then go right back to Thomas Jefferson. His vision... Well, they set a context where that could emerge. Right. They said the, and, and not only did they set the, con mm -hmm. the context, but they worked really, really hard. Jefferson essentially sacrificed his whole life to the public service. Mm -hmm. He said, nothing makes me more happy than to render any service in my power. Mm -hmm. of whatever description, and he meant it, and he lived, lived by that. Mm -hmm. He worked really, really hard. He was a very industrious individual. Yeah. And in the last 60 years of his life, he lived till he was 83 years old. 83, he was, right. He was okay. born in 1743, yeah. mm -hmm. and he died in 1826, yeah. uh, July 4th. July, same day. Same day as John Adams, his, his, his friend. Amazing, yeah. And in that time of public service, 
He held nine public offices. A lot of people don't realize that. Yeah, he, was he was president, of course, and he was vice president under John Adams. Right. And his third executive office was wartime governor of Virginia. He was governor of Virginia in the last two years mm -hmm. of the Revolutionary War. A yeah. tremendously difficult time when he had basically nothing to work with and his state was being invaded by the British uh, military. He was vice president when the Alien Sedition Acts were put through? Yes, and there, there again is... Did he, go, did he go along with that, or did he fight it? There again is an there example is an of, example. Uh, of an effort, of a sacrifice uh -huh. that he made of his time, his effort, and basically not tending to his own farms to, to fight uh -huh. what he thought was uh, in, an encroachment of uh, aristocracy, elitism, uh, and centralized exercise of coercive power mm -hmm. that he thought was going to be the downfall of the full flowering of the promise of the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. If you recall what was going on then in the late yeah. 1790s, yeah. you had Washington had retired mm -hmm. and everyone was wondering who was going to lead the country. He was yeah. almost a kingly. Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, could have become king. He could have become yeah. king, and everyone just. And that's what was legit. That was what was considered legitimate at those days. It was amazing to understand. But people, people were, that was a source of to, legitimacy. To lay down yeah. your power, yeah, military or civilian executive power was almost unheard of. Mm -hmm. and that's why Washington was so rightly thought of as a heroic, mm -hmm. patriotic, self-sacrificing individual. And he but when he Hessians stepped down, in Jersey, yeah. absolutely, in Bucks County, in Bucks County, yeah, right, yeah. turned the tide of the war. Really, yeah, it was absolutely. Really an yeah, oh yeah, sorry. So yeah. he uh, he steps uh. down, and everyone's saying, "Where is this going to go?" Well, the opposition party to Jefferson was called the Federalist Party, if mm -hmm. you recall, and mm -hmm. uh, there were there was uh, contenders for the leadership of it. John Adams, he was the president, mm -hmm. um, and you had Alexander Hamilton. You had a lot of so-called high Federalists in New England, which really, really believed in the elite. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to have anything to do with any notions of egalitarianism, right. whether in economics or in politics or voting or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were moving to consolidate their power. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a war scare, a war with France. They started raising taxes, uh, incurring a lot of debt. They sent the revenuers out to central Pennsylvania to sort of lay taxes on the Corn farmers out makers? there, the whiskey makers, yeah. to try to pay for their expansive... Shays Rebellion? Sh right. Yeah. And so Jefferson saw all this in horror, and he was vice president. Mm -hmm. And so he said, wait a minute here, this has got to stop. Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, the Federalists in power uh, tried to consolidate their control. And they passed the famous, infamous Alien Sedition Acts, mm -hmm. uh, which made it very easy to deport people. They were, mm -hmm. that, that aspect of the law was never fully pushed. You but, shall not criticize. But the Sedition yeah. Act. Yeah, the Alien Sedition. Yeah. The Sedition Acts, they were enforced mm -hmm. by Federalist prosecutors. Mm -hmm. And over 20 newspaper editors were actually arrested and thrown in jail and fined for daring to criticize President John Adams. Mm -hmm. John Adams. Uh, to his great discredit, signed the Alien Sedition Acts. Well, this was enough for, 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 for Jefferson. He mobilized, uh, a f he was a great tactician. Yeah. He mobilized. He was practical as He was practical. He yeah. mobilized mm -hmm. uh, opposition forces for, the, re for the, the Republican Party. It was called the Democratic Republican mm -hmm. Party. Mm -hmm. uh, and through great strategic and tactical maneuverings uh, and putting forth a very solid campaign of what the issues were all about, mm -hmm. the issues of the full promise of the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. He won, and he and But for that victory, we may not have even enjoyed our liberties and so forth today. It could have floundered, right, it, it, on that it, point. It, yeah. it could have foundered yeah. on that point. Uh, he was insistent that a Bill of Rights be added to the Constitution mm -hmm. when it first was uh, proposed in the late 1780s. Was that over slavery that they had that they couldn't do it because there were, or did that focus in that time? And I wonder if I could ask you a question. Did George the Third ever call George Washington a terrorist? Was uh, he ever referred to as a terrorist or I, I some think bounder, I've read that comparable somewhere. word that is applied right now to people in the world? They called Nelson Mandela a terrorist. Uh, of course, or, and, or, or people, a rebel. People, or rebel. Or something like that. And also, if I could, maybe you can help set it straight, because you're really familiar with it. Uh, we had a revolution coming. We had a legitimate order. We had been part of the, the empire of Britain. That was the way of what they call legitimacy in terms of the system in place was this dynastic thing. And uh, that we had these revolutionary people who were thinking, we're going to make a revolution. But there were a lot of people in the colonies. And if I have my history, it's not very well done and everything. Or, well, you know, but I think there were, if you were to say, there were about a third 
of the people making up the population of North America then were really in favor of the revolution. A third of them were out and out Tories, and a third of them were sort of in between. So you had a minority group. They were a minority group, and had they not, they said their sacred honor, had they not pulled it off at Trenton or wherever, they would have been hung as traitors, right? In terms of the ongoing yeah, movement of history. They were well aware that their activities so were, they were, they were, were classified as in a, tre in treasonous. Yeah, basically. treasonous and outlaws and sure. so forth, much the way we might regard Osama bin Laden now. Well, you know, I... Or I Robin Hood was by King John. You know, that, that's, that's a whole set of, of issues of, of, of proper use of power and war and peace, which maybe we can turn to in a minute. Yeah. In, in Jefferson's time, they really did risk everything. When yeah. He said we're risking our, our, our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Uh, Cornwallis, when he invaded uh, Virginia toward the end of the war, actually mm -hmm. had somebody go chase Jefferson uh, right up to as Charlottesville a as, a as a renegade. renegade yeah. right? And yeah. uh, it, would have, it, it would have been great to sort of bag the author of the Declaration of Independence and Couldn't, yeah. perhaps yeah. even take him back to England yeah, and, uh, in shackles and yeah. so forth. They really did risk a lot. Yeah, uh, and the so language of the "we hold these truths to be self-evident" it is so. It's so, uh, and and that they said, why should they not wait for King George to approve their decisions and so forth? Right. And they thought that they were in authority. Authorities do that. Lord Acton said it tends to corrupt to power. Now, and absolute right. power corrupts now, absolutely. Now you you just alluded to some some international uh, issues. Well, I'd like to try and, and think of and maybe this uh, yeah, the example like is relevant to the world order it of is, the, it, our time. It is in this sense. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, when Jefferson was alive, his whole life, as I said, he died in 1826, he lived yeah. a long time. Yeah. Uh, there were two great powers in the world. France, uh, and, France England. and England. He yeah. called England the Leviathan of the ocean and <laughs> France the mammoth of the land. Uh -huh. And they're always lording it over everyone else. They had the legitimacy of the moment. They, the they did. They, they were had the, they assumed had the, legitimate. They had the power, and and, and anyone who questioned that were bounders, outlaws. Right. And America, as Jefferson saw it, was the, the fragile plant of liberty. Now, do you think there which are people blown about in the hurricanes of their now wars? Now, do you see people who, at this present time in this world, things see the United States of America in the position of Britain and France in that time? Well, as saying they have. Mr. Fukuyama just wrote a book called The End of History that it's all over now, that we've defeated the Soviet Union, we don't need anything because we got the perfect order. And maybe if you take Jefferson and then Mr. Uh, the people, the neocon notions of how things are going to be ordered, we finally got it together for the end of time. We don't need to think about anything in a major qualitative way. Well, and I, is I the think system in place now, the legitimacy assumed by the people that are walking the world in such big league boots now saying they're going to put this system on all the world, is it ever going to be in a qualitative way challenged, or well, did Mr. Jefferson lay down a pattern that's good for the ages, for all the world, for the rest of time? Well, he was, Jefferson was, a, I feel he was a seer. Yes. He was a visionary. He was a seeker of truth, and he tried to sort of examine history and examine um, the, the noblest ideals, if you will, that have ever been or, or uttered and articulated for individuals as well as for nations. Within and an say that as a, 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 a pre-industrial pre era. Much less and yet he's, he's really talking world. about human nature yeah, uh, and human know. tendencies and human institutions, our human failings as well as our, our, our divine ideals, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so he's on the receiving end of this, these assertions of power mm -hmm. from, from England and from France. Mm. Uh, and he, f he felt it very keenly, particularly when he was president. He didn't really have much to work with economically or militarily uh -huh. uh, when they were fighting each other and impressing American seamen and so yeah, forth right. and, and taking ships mm -hmm. during their wars, the mm -hmm. Napoleonic Wars when he was president. Barbary pilots. So he, so he said, this is, this is what he yes. would say to us today. Yes. I hope uh, our wisdom will grow with our power and teach us that the less we use our power, the greater it shall be. In other words, he could foresee the day when America as a continental nation would would become a world power. I think it could be projected from that. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't for sure because yeah, yeah. It, it, particularly if it wasn't for Jefferson, he was the one who acquired the middle we third of the country yeah, right. and purchased yeah, and yeah. he staked the claim for the, for the Western Continent. third yeah. through the Lewis and Clark. Destiny, yeah, right. Laid and he, want, he wanted right. an empire for liberty. Or an empire. He wanted empire. And over a large expanse right. of self-government, uh -huh. uh, not for conquest. I mean, th there was an, air, an aspect of conquest to it. Well, there were it was, some it was unavoidable. Indians there that had to be done in Tale of, Tear, Trail it, of Tears. It was 
some Absolutely. pretty nasty stuff happened on our watch. Most of it after him. Oh, all right. But he wanted a strong nation that would serve as an example to the world mm -hmm. of uh, his vision, mm -hmm. the rights of man, self-government, equality, pursuit of happiness, okay. freedom, and so forth. Uh -huh. So um, he would say today, I would feel quite strongly, that we should be uh, an example of what he called the sacred fire of liberty and self-government. And he said, which from whence it is to light up the rest of the world, mm -hmm. if the rest of the world shall ever become susceptible of its benign influence. Mm -hmm. He felt that we should be an example, that we should have nothing to do with conquest. He said, if, if there be one thing more deeply rooted in the mind of every American than any other, it is that we should have nothing to do with conquest. And he had, he was, there was very clear reasoning behind that. Mm -hmm. He said that every man and every body of men, a society, a nation, whatever, possesses the right of self-government. I govern myself, you govern yourself, my nation governs itself, your nation governs itself. We each have to find our own way mm -hmm. within our own uh, search for truth within, the search for justice, equality, and prosperity within our own society. And you cannot really effectively impose that from the outside. It's wrong to do so, and it's ineffectual. It does not produce happiness. It's not virtuous because it doesn't produce happiness. You can't you try to force your way of life uh -huh. on someone else, and whether you it's religious, political, uh -huh. or anything else. You can't project power. What was happening in Vietnam, and what was happening in Iraq now, and uh, you know, I mean, th that's what I'm saying. Is is the thing? Is, is the system in place for the ages, or is there? No. We've had a, th that, if I may. The, the Constitution and that government was set up on the eve of the Industrial Revolution, which was going to transform into an agriculturally based economy. I don't think they knew about uh, Bessemer furnaces or steel industry or automobiles. They didn't know. They didn't know about airplanes flying through the air, anything of that sort. And now we've come into a time in our age now uh, where we have a postmodernist world, which is beyond the Industrial Revolution in information technology and so forth. The world is changing. We have a place in order that we've been locked into for 225 years. Is it possible that the bait, and we have institutions that pro uh, project upon notions of human nature, human education, what can be done, that sort of thing. We have that, that have been in place for that long a time, and yet the world is changing because of the technology and the altering situation. Do you think there is a head a qualitative transformation that will call into question some of the basic assumptions by which the United States of America is organized now and projects its power. It's got, it's got military force in 200, 130 countries around the world now, and they say they have a model for all the world. And Mr. Fukuyama said it's a model we need question anything else because it's for the ages. But is a qualitative change or a challenge to the system blowing in the wind in the future or now and why are there so many people within the world who question the legitimacy of the Anja regime, the modern Assad regime, that the United States claims, perhaps as Louis XVI claimed in 1789, as being legitimate from the hand of God or for some provided, you know, some, some, some inevitable system that doesn't have to be ever challenged in any qualitative way, or are qualitative changes ahead in terms, or is it possible to have qualitative changes that would bring just I saw Senator Mr. Carter, President Carter, it was asked the question, do we live in a just world? He said, of course not. Can we ever live in a just world? Or will we ever live in a just world? Or are there changes and challenges to that system that's been laid down that you can see coming in terms of the evolution of events on this planet? Well, I, I believe that the vision of Thomas Jefferson mm -hmm. um, is really the vision that people around the world uh, love and respect about America. Yeah, you got it. And, mm -hmm. and to the extent that we are able to keep focused on that vision um, of light and liberty, we will continue to attract the respect and warm regard of people around the world. We don't have that if, much of the if, people now. Well, that's not to say that there's anything wrong with the America's vision. Who's putting those forces all over the world now if it's not America? Well, that's the, a that's the interpretation or the application 
uh, of someone's view of what America's vision should be. Personally, yeah, huh? I, I think Jefferson would be quite distressed because Jefferson was a man of peace. Mm -hmm. um, and just for example, yes. a lot of people may not know that when he sent Lewis and Clark out on, on their yeah, mission, major, major, he, yeah. he, he, he gave them a large crate of bronze medallions. Mm -hmm. They were called Indian Peace Medals. Uh -huh. One side was the image of Thomas Jefferson, President of the U.S., 1803. Yeah. The other side yeah. was a tomahawk overlaid by a peace pipe and the words peace and friendship. Mm -hmm. And he had Lewis and Clark give one of these medals to each Indian chief that he met to try as a gesture. He was a man of peace. He's, his philosophy was peace and friendship with all mankind is our wisest policy. They gave him the medal as they stole the lands and put them on a reservation. Oh no, he tried to no, he, really, he tried uh, to form relations with them uh -huh. and deal with the what essentially was the European white man onslaught that was sweeping over the West Which and as did. practical as practically uh, ameliorate the negative effects of that as 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 much as you possibly could. For but example, those white man Americans violated practically every treaty we ever made with the indigenous nations and put them on reservations and treated a, a them lot of them awful. did. A lot of them did. Yeah. And a lot of them didn't. There was a lot of land that was sold. For it's example, it's true. You had old it It's yeah. not a completely black uh, and white situation. But I think every, ever every, is, everyone, yeah. I think Jefferson would recognize yeah. the the, the, uh, the unfortunate downside. Uh, of what transpired in the creation of, of, of the United States of America. It's power, yeah. So, but he felt it was important to establish the United States as a continental um, beacon for the rest of the world. Uh, he saw three wars. Mm -hmm. He saw the French and Indian War. Right. He saw the but Revolutionary he, War of American uh, Independence. Yeah. Yeah. He saw the War of 1812. Yeah. And he said, uh, I, ab I abhor war. Mm -hmm. And I view it as the greatest scourge of mankind. Mm -hmm. If nations were to go to war for every degree of injury, there would never be peace on earth. Okay. Uh, he wasn't a pacifist, of course. You mentioned he sent the Marines over to squelch the Barbary pirates who were extorting. 1812, was it? That was 1804, 1803. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Who yeah. were extorting American yeah, shipping yeah. for 30 right. years. Yeah. Um, but he did, it was interesting, a lot of people don't know this, uh, when in his second term as president, mm -hmm. uh, again during the Napoleonic Wars, the British captured a, an American frigate called the Chesapeake. Okay. And they killed four sailors and they uh, impressed many others. Mm -hmm. The whole country was gripped by a war fever. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, he argued for an embargo instead rather than a war. He said, I was never pleased to hold the confidence of the people in the power of my office as I was at the time of the incident of Chesapeake okay. where I was able to use both mm -hmm. for the prevention of war and the preservation of peace. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it didn't last six years later. We had the War of 1812 yeah. arise, but he at least they established... The, they, burned the, they burned the capital. They, then, they burned the capital, yeah, right. Yeah, um, yeah. But Thomas Jefferson really was, uh, really felt that, uh, as I said, peace and friendship with all mankind is our wisest policy. If peace is our passion, he said. The lamentable recourse of war yeah. should be used for actual injuries only it, and not for evils of the imagination. Very good. And he was at that time, they were a relatively fledgling power. They were not a great power. I suppose the British, with their many armies and navies and things, thought the power, the exercise of power and the projection of power was perfectly fine because they had all the cannons. So it was a strategic thing on the part of Jefferson to say they don't want to do it. But then we build up, you know, the things change, and the power of things change. And well, we have, you know what I'm saying? yes, I, I know what you're saying. I, let, in, terms yeah. of, in terms of kind of guessing at what Thomas Jefferson might say today, in terms yeah. of our role in the world, mm -hmm. um, I would think that he would say that we face uh, a unique opportunity. Now Be you're talking now. 2005. 2000 now, because what if you were the, commenting today, yeah. I think he would basically say that the, the challenge is uh, to... Uh, do what no other great world power has ever done mm -hmm. and restrain ourselves. He said, in order to procure uh, tranquility, mm -hmm. we must avoid fear mm -hmm. and desire, which he called the two principal diseases of the mind. And by that he meant we have to sort of deal with our human tendencies right. to, to fear the future, fear others, 
or desire, the, 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 the seven deadly sins, greed yeah, yeah. and so forth. Envy's in there too. And, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And now that we have the power, mm. what other great world power has ever restrained itself and said, no, I respect you. Washington you, set an example, didn't he? He set an yeah, example. Yeah. Uh, I respect you. You have the responsibility and the right to decide your country's future for, 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 your, for yourselves, for the people in your country. You have to find your own way. He truly believed that, that the people were responsible and they had the, 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 the naturally given right to provide for their own government and they had to find their own way. And he felt that it had to be, a, that patience was a very important virtue, that the light that we were talking about right. earlier Our was necessary to sustain liberty uh, grows slowly over time. He said the ground of liberty is to be gained by inches. Mm -hmm. And by that he meant a society has to grow and progress through education, through, through civilization, through a growing sense of light, growing sense of identification and oneness with each other mm -hmm. before it can really want or sustain liberties. And if a society, it's almost axiomatic in Jefferson's mm -hmm. view, yeah. if society acquires liberty or self-government before they're ready, before they have enough light to sustain it, uh, they, they won't be able to hold on to it. Well, and that so light would be, I mean, uh, Hitler said, if you give me the youth, and those are five, we've got them. And it, it light and l the light or education, one man's education is another man's indoctrination. And that what you got to do is put certain people, you know what I'm saying, they can influence people in any kind well, of that's way. That's coercion. And we live in co well, that's coercion. That's coercion. And that Jefferson stood most fundamentally against coercion. Right. He said, well, I Well, we live in a coercive society, do we not? I mean, all of our it, institutions are relative. in a certain sense, at least Marxist-oriented people will say, we live in a situation. They had a piece in the New York Times, if I may, about two weeks ago, Sunday fold, above the fold on the Sunday paper, front page, about the wealth in this country and that uh, we have capital instruments are very narrowly held. Uh, we don't have anything like a democracy in terms of the ownership of the capital instruments creating wealth and that they said that the situation is getting to where you have a super wealthy group that is separating themselves from the merely upper middle class or merely wealthy. The super wealthy are getting overwhelmingly wealthy while people go hungry in this country even. And that they have a class thing based on that. And there are some people who say all of our institutions, the corporate structure is not democratic. It's sort of like the military. The senior vice president tells everyone what to do. The schools, I've talked to a lot of young people who think the school systems are not you know, it, it, you have to go there even though you don't want to. And yet, coming with this internet and so forth, a new birth of freedom may be coming that has not been characteristic and all of our institutions are authoritarian and they're held together by a situation of distributing income to people through wages that if they do not do what that wage system tells them they will do, they will not have the right to eat food. So that it's not really freedom in the sense well, of having a competence. This, this is where of. I was talking before about Jefferson's vision mm -hmm. and then the interpretation of it or the application of it. Right. And, and it's, you, you just articulated a certain political economy philosophy mm -hmm. which many would agree with and many would dispute. And it would, it, the argument would be over the meaning of, of, of the word equality. Again, mm -hmm. the, the vision being the vision of freedom, the rights of man, self-government, equality, and the pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. Many would critique what you just said, and so there's plenty of opportunity in society for the pursuit of happiness, for individual merit, pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps, and yeah, so forth. Yeah, we like to think we're a meritocracy. But, but in yeah. support of what you just said, yeah. um, uh, Jefferson fought, uh, for example, in his time against manifestations of inequality, uh, primogeniture, entail, keeping the estates together, you can't break them up, big, huge estates everything goes with firstborn son. These were manifestations of a lack of equality agenda, during yeah. his time. Yeah. Okay, now yeah. you look at the situation today, and if what you said is true, I think it is if, without if, any if you question. Have, if you have not just and it's getting wealthy the, people, the trend, the trend but, is getting know, that way. Yeah. You know, I read some of those yeah. statistics too, yeah. where maybe 13 or 15,000 people control like 40% of the wealth of this country. Maybe more even. Something yeah. like that. Now, is and that... Very few people have any ownership in a means where they get a sufficient degree of income coming to them to give them an independent Dependent competence to live without having to be in terms of one of these top-down authoritarian institutions right. by so which if you, if they you can earn their living. If you start, it's not a liberation. If, if, if you there. start uh, changing the tax code of this country, yeah. which has been one means of trying to sort of levelize things at least a little bit yeah. and achieve a little bit more in terms of equality, mm -hmm. uh, then I think you'd have some Jeffersonian-type concerns yeah. over equality. 
But as far as our yeah. ability to yeah. pursue our individual seeking of truth, mm -hmm. uh, Thomas Jefferson, above all, was a fiercely independent thinker. An individual and liberty. Yeah. Individual liberty. He said, he said, I think he would look very upset about the fact that the wealth is so concentrated in the modern example. I, I think he would. That would be the Employment Act, we distribute it. They're all wage earners. They have no interest in them. And, and, and the technology is becoming ever more responsible for production, apart from the wage imp I mean, the labor input. That 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 again. That, that's, sync, that know? is that is a question of whether or not we've strayed from the vision of equality oh. that he fought so hard to establish. Oh, oh. I think there's a there's a good argument to be made that we have strayed, and we ought to think about trying to sort of get back to it a little uh -huh. bit. Well, um, uh -huh. I I was particularly. He said the cost of liberty is eternal vigilance, and he said in the Declaration of Independence, when a government or a system becomes not able to, it, it's the right of the citizen to make a revolution against it. He, Thomas Jefferson was a rebel. And he was. He, he felt that, that each individual citizen had to be constantly on guard for the protection of their liberties. He said there's only two legitimate objects of government, mm -hmm. the equal rights of man and the happiness of every individual. Every individual, not just the few right. that have and, everything. And you, right, you have I to mean, they're participate. Like, they're, like, they're like dynastic the heads of state, the, the people, you know. It's, and I just saw a thing on television, it's Patty Hearst. She was with the Symbionese, and they were going to make a revolution and so forth. You don't see anything like that ever shaping up a revolution that challenges in some fundamental political, economic philosophy or something the, the grounding policy statements of our institutional structures we've had for 220 I, years. I, 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 I have, I have faith. I liberation. Have, I have faith in Jefferson's optimistic vision of the future uh -huh. uh, of our country and, and of all people around the world because he was a global man, a global thinker. Yeah. Jefferson really felt that, uh, uh, he said, uh, a, a nation mm -hmm. as a society mm -hmm. forms a moral person okay. and every member of it is mm -hmm. personally responsible for his society. That was part of his notion of light. And he said, if we do not, if we're not vigilant in the protection of our liberties and the, in the advancement of our ideals as a mm -hmm. country, like the ideal of egalitarianism that we were just talking about, mm -hmm. we will lose our ideals, we will lose our freedoms. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he said that we have to be constantly on guard, you have to give information to the people, mm -hmm. you have to trust the people, and that the spirit of the people has to rise up uh, when they see that their liberties and the vision that we all cherish are challenged in any significant way. Uh -huh. And I think a lot of that may be going on I think it might outs be. outside the purview of the normal channels of communication uh -huh. that we're, we're so often exposed That's to. And I think, as you say, yeah. the internet, uh, all sorts of other forms of communication uh -huh. for allowing of individual expression. Uh -huh. Uh, of what you might say is unorthodox opinion these days. Yeah. It's uh, my view, and my hope is that it's all kind of yeah. bubbling there, and that yeah. the citizens are really going to take responsibility for self-government. Well, they can. Yes, we, we, have, we have to value self-government. Absolutely, it was all nice blessings. that we had some. I mean, right. because we used to have uh, town hall meetings or something, but I think an awful lot of people feel as though it's all in the hands of a few people who run everything, and that they don't have anything. It doesn't matter what they say; they can put their word in here or something. But they have no power because you got spin meisters and pu public relations and this kind of thing and everything that sort of thing. I don't. I think they're feeling a, di a, a sense of, and then also it's maybe economics and so forth. And uh, uh, back to you're in the business of doing a putting a legal structure for municipalities that put in water information, you know, infrastructure things. And I noticed in the paper about that you have you're involved in various parts of the contract negotiations, and it says design build and operate, and you have a hyphen between them. Those are all parts of how we put infrastructure in place, technological infrastructure in place. Do we have a design capability, that is a knowledge of something that we can do, let's say under our current system, with these people getting richer, under-roading canes and so forth, under-roading demand, uh, we, ha that we have a design capability to do good things for the society that we are not able because of the financial uh, uh, structure by which we operate and so forth, that we have, a, we have an unutilized uh, capability more than we're able to do because the political and economic structures by which we do things does not allow us to do what we know we're capable of doing in terms of bringing good, uh, technologically augmented capability 
to help the people of our, our, pla uh, of our country and the world? Is there an unutilized capability in terms of the design and what our financial institutions will allow yes, us yes, to do? Yes, yes. And isn't that, in a certain sense, something that, that should be really addressed in a fundamental yes. way? And then you have to build demand and some ownership of those capital instruments that are responsible for production into the folks so that they have a stream of income apart from their their participation in a wage slave system. The, the, the freedoms... That's a fundamental thing. The, the, the freedoms that we still enjoy in this no. country do provide a lot of opportunity for people to express themselves, to grow, to learn. Uh, we haven't quite backslid to, to anywhere near the degree that I think a lot of people fear. I'm they're, troubled they're, by the trend. The, the tr there's a seen. trend line they're there. They're serious. You can see tectonic faults. The tectonic, you can see yeah. the... If and you, on if a you, world if scale. If you take the Jefferson's notion of yeah. kings, priests, and nobles, yeah. if you take nobles as large financial and corporate interests and well, so forth... Well, it'd be corporate interests or bankers. If, 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 you, yeah. if you take the, the priests just kind of symbolically as those who would attempt to coerce others mm -hmm. with their particular religious uh, views, mm -hmm. Um, and if you if you take uh, kings as you know elected officials who are full of themselves and uh, lacking that humility or that sense of feeling neither superior nor inferior to anyone else, some that we people see say, the neocons that way. Yeah, oh. these are basic principles. Now, I I feel though that fundamentally, yeah, right. Jefferson would urge uh, dialogue urge on us all, all these matters. Dialogue would, on all these matters. Public yeah. education, right. exchange of views. Right. The public we, access television. Public access television. Amen. And yeah. we appreciate yeah. that yeah. you're doing this. Yeah. He really was a believer in the importance of an individual search for truth. Right. Right. Um, he said, I, "I am of a sect by myself, mm -hmm. as far as I know. Mm -hmm. If I could not go to heaven, but with a party, mm -hmm. I would not go there at all." Oh, really? Yeah, he and was he, very he much urged and each he also individual to pursue truth within and take take our God-given capacities and our uh -huh. inspiration and, and try to expand and improve and perfect ourselves. Right, right. And he had beautiful lines about how if he had the chance to be doing something for the public good rather than just his own good, it would be for the public good. Beautiful. He was so eloquent. He, Wasn't he, he, was, he was I, beautifully eloquent. Yeah, yeah. And what I tried to do in, yes. this, in yeah, this book... Yeah, we haven't even shown it yet. Let's <laughs> let people see what it looks like for crying out loud. This is one of the best books out on the shelves these days. And can you come in tight on that? And we'll put up at the end. It's Light and Liberty and its Reflections on the... Pursuit of Happiness. Pursuit of Happiness by Thomas, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson is the, is the, has the byline. He's the author. These are all He's his words. Yeah. I'm really the editor. Yeah. Let's say he, you know, he, he was the composer of the music. So I'm really the arranger, let's you've, say. You've done like, if I may, you've done like, uh, they're his words, so you've done like he did with the Jefferson Bible, taking just Very supposedly similar. the words of Jesus and putting and cutting out all that sacerdotal interpretation or obiter he, dictum that he, was done. Thomas Jefferson, again, was a very private man with his faith. Uh -huh. He said, I never told my religion uh -huh. or scrutinized that of another. Uh -huh. I never attempted to make a convert mm -hmm. or wished to change another's creed. Yeah. He said, people didn't even know that he was a man of deep personal faith. Yeah. They called him an atheist and a fanatic for, for advocating the separation of church and state yeah, that and was for advocating thing, yeah. freedoms. They called it mobocracy. Yeah. The Federalists called Jefferson's advocate advocacy of equality and freedom, mm -hmm. mobocracy. So they criticized him a lot. But he was a man who really believed in the search for truth within. Yeah. And he had a faith, he had a private faith that would proceed from his heart uh -huh. as well as fr from his head. Yeah. And you can see it in his various writings. Yeah. Uh, he called the, the Declaration of Independence the genuine effusion of the soul of our country that at that time. Uh, beautiful. He, yeah, believed, yeah. he believed in the importance of... And he of was widely respected among the founders, wasn't he? Oh, they, yeah. they, they made him president. They, they, he and John Adams were the last of the founders, uh -huh. and he was held in, in high regard during his time. Yeah. He was also you know, criticized heavily as he fought in the trenches to establish his principles. Uh -huh. But he, he really believed that each individual has a responsibility, and that's where it all starts. Mm -hmm. um, he, a he actually believed yeah. that there would be, a, as he put it, a, a future state of rewards and punishments. He you said mean afterlife. Uh, no, uh, is that when, when you conclude? To? He was very general in the way Karma. he put it. Well, yeah, he, yeah, he's uh, what goes around comes around. Yeah, right, However, yeah. you want to call it. Yeah, he's, he, this is the way he put it again yeah. in his in his yeah. elegant way. He said, "Faith and works will show their worth by their weight in the mm -hmm. scales of eternal justice." Mm 
before God's tribunal. Oh. In other words, we're here to serve the creation. The mm -hmm. Creator has given us all these blessings and rights. Mm -hmm. We are here to serve this creation and do the best we can. Mm -hmm. And he said that uh, happiness, we haven't talked about happiness. Let's take, take a minute there, on that. We only got about a minute left or so, so he it's said, down the sound bite time. Yeah, so, sound yeah. bite. Okay, yeah. he said that happiness is the aim of life, uh -huh. and virtue is the foundation of happiness. Uh -huh. And utility is the test of virtue. Something has to actually work to produce happiness, uh -huh. to be virtuous. Right, right. And so when I went through all of his 20,000 letters yeah. and putting together Light and Liberty, yeah. I looked for succinct expressions of various virtues. Yeah. And the book indeed is organized into 34 chapters yes. of virtues and good qualities, uh -huh. like aspiration, truth-seeking, uh, peace, uh, humility, gratitude, and so mm -hmm. forth. And I mm -hmm. took these succinct expressions and I pieced them together into smooth flowing essays you as sure if they were have. written at a single time. Uh -huh. And so you can read this three or four or five pages a night. You can read a couple chapters before you go to bed, draw some inspiration. Uh -huh. He said, I never go to bed at night without an hour or half hour's reading of something moral whereon to ruminate in the intervals of sleep. Well, I'd like to say, I don't think you can do better than having your night table this book. We'd like to let you know about it. Life and uh, Liberty, or um, um, light, light, and liberty. light and liberty, and uh, recommended very highly on a man who was so eloquent, had thoughts that are really. And the one problem being, as you say, read it for three or four. The problem is, it's very hard to put down once you get going. It's a magnificent work, and we congratulate you very much, uh, Eric, on his putting it together. Thank you so much. Wish for you all the best in your good work in terms of helping to fill that gap between our uh, design capability and the actuality in the world within a system that is only going to bring some equity into the society. Maybe one of those things. I think Mr. Jefferson would look with great favor upon the work in your law work and also certainly on this book, and we thank you for it. Kind of you to say that. It's and Mr. Jefferson had taken the words of Jesus and put them into his Jefferson Bible in the same kind of way. It's your pleasure to have had his perceptions. We, we on Conversations with White Tuning, we'll be coming back again, uh, well, tomorrow. We'll be coming back again tomorrow. Happy 4th of July, one and all. This is the 229th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence where those rebels put together that call to the world and it's, it, it, they live down through the ages and we invite you all to go out and watch the fireworks, have a good time and uh, thanks again, Eric, very much for putting the book together and for coming in. It was my pleasure, Harold. Thank you. Your pleasure. Please tune in. We'll be coming back again tomorrow, as we say. and. Uh, only just got started on the surface, and the book is so beautifully, there's so much wisdom in that book, it's really hard, and I really congratulate you on I having thank you. done it's the editing, yeah. I, I appreciate it, you know, it, the, um, the sense that I got, and mm -hmm. I want, want to try to create, and I think it's, it's reflected in the book, is you, you feel like you're a friend of Thomas Jefferson, because yeah. most of it, 90% of it comes from his letters, Yeah. Uh, and so you feel, you know, most of his letters would have, would be informational, uh, almost like we have on a phone call, you know, exchanging, catching up with people, right. and giving views. But they're 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 studded with all sorts of wonderful observations mm -hmm. about human condition and human progress. Yeah. And that's what's in here. So if it has a letter quality type feeling to it, and yet it's it's this high these high ideals you think Thomas expressed Jefferson? in a personal way. You think Thomas Jefferson? He's gotten too friendly toward the newspapers. The time. You think he would be participating in public access to uh, per screening of internet programming around? Him?